am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can come to God except by me. There is no alternative. Hello viewers, you are welcome once again to another edition of View from the Top, a project of the Builders with God ministry. Today we are having Pastor Noel Abdullahi in the studio with us to talk about the prophetic advantage. Join us as we go through something amazing. Pastor, what do you have to say about that? Oh yes, uh, good evening esteemed viewers and again, uh, thank you for taking out the time to join us in these um, wonderful times we have looking at the Word of God. So, well, um, I'll be running us through uh, what I titled Prophetic Advantage, basically to um, give some connection to our daily lives as to what we heard last week about the prophetic. So I'll give a brief recap of what um, Pastor Yomi shared with us last Sunday, and then we're going to drill in deeper on that and see how that connects to our everyday living and how we can use that um, prophetic advantage to actually be at advantage. Because you can have an advantage and you may not, you may not use it or you may not uh, optimize it because sometimes you, you don't really know how to use it. So we are hoping that uh, by the end of this broadcast, at least you will receive some clarity on how you can take full advantage of the prophetic, you know, in your daily lives. So um, stay tuned and then let me just give the recap. So last week, uh, we saw the need for the church to be prophetic in times like this. We looked at the definitions of who a prophet is and what prophecy was. We also saw the prophetic timeline from Abel till death. And then we also saw the influence of Apostle Paul and other church leaders in producing a prophetic generation. Viewers, a prophet and the most prophetical generation shall the Lord raise in this end time because the prophetic is our advantage. And I and you are so privileged that we can be part of that prophetic generation. But we must be able to see how we can take full advantage of this prophetic from the things that we have we are used to all the things that we have been doing before which are things i'm going to be sharing with us again today but i'll be looking at those things in light of the prophetic there are still mostly spiritual disciplines that we have all always been doing but we're now going to look at it more through the lens of the prophetic so uh before we proceed uh we'll just read our anchor scripture today uh which is the book of matthew chapter 24 from verse 6 to 13, many people call this the, the spinal cord of the end time prophecy. And I will also, also, I also, I also want to call it um, one of the most wonderful um, prophetic intelligence that God gave his people to make them ready, you know, for the times that we are in. So um, Esther would read that scripture for us and then we'll take our flight from there. Matthew 24, verse 6 to 13. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, for the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Many of us have read these scriptures over and over again, and we've actually heard people preach from them. And um, I'm sure that um, there is nothing there that uh, we are not seeing around us. And in, ironically, this scripture was written, written 
uh, almost 2,000 years, 2,000 years ago. And um, even before now, there's nothing new under the sun. These things have been happening. But we are just seeing that the proportions that these things are happening are increasing as we come towards the end of the age. Because every day that we, we wake up, every new day is a day closer to the end of this age. And um, this age will have to close because we are all looking for um, the, 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 the um, how do I call it now? We are all looking for when Jesus will come and, and reign on earth. Uh, you know, they said uh, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the age to come. So there is an age after now. So everything that we have right now will continue to degenerate. Things will continue to get worse until we enter into that age which is to come. And um, that's why the Bible says, look up for your redemption is near. So um, we must know that this age has to end so that we can enter into the new age. Uh, most importantly, uh, verse 13 is actually where I will be dwelling on because it's very crucial. Um, we've heard of so many things that are going to happen, but one key thing that I see is that no matter how, how, how much of the prophecies you know and understand, it's not enough. You need more than that. I think the end of it is for us to be able to, um, to endure till the end. That's the crux. That's the crux of verse 13. And that's actually where, you know, I want us to take it up from. And the question I ask is, how do we endure to the end? And um, it's important at this point that um, we, we kind of uh, put a framework that will help us endure to the end. And that's actually what gives us that the prophetic advantage actually helps us. It's one of the things that will help us, you know, to endure to the end. But we're going to be looking at it under four pillars or four practices mm. that will give us access into that prophetic advantage that God has given to us. That advantage, you can access it. There is a way that God has designed that we can access the prophetic advantage. And usually this happens through practices that we are all used to, but we, many of us are not able to connect it to the prophetic. But if, if once we're able to connect these practices to the prophetic, then we'll be positioned to actually to take full advantage of the prophetic grace that God is releasing upon his people at this time. Now, there are four of them. The first one is the learning, learning of the scriptures. Uh, the second one is the fellowship of the saints or of the disciples. Uh, the third one is prayers. And then the last but not the least is discipleship. So we'll quickly go to the first one. Um, which is learning of the scriptures. That's the first one. And we need to connect this learning of the scriptures to the prophetic. That's when we can get the prophetic advantage that uh, learning of the scripture has to offer us. So um, we need to be able to look at prophetic books, study prophetic books in the Bible. Um, key ones are the books of Revelation, and the books of Daniel. You don't run away from those books because you think they are, they are not understandable. You can understand them. And people have done a lot of teachings about them. And um, some people say when they read, they get afraid. I don't think the fact that you get, it's still the word of God. It, it tells you of ominous things that would happen. And you cannot be playing the ostrich. The reality is that these things are bound to happen. So a part of your preparation is to be aware that these things are are really going to happen that this present world will be destroyed and um, having that knowledge helps you to live wisely in this world it will help you not to put all your eggs all your hopes in this world it will help you to live wisely to, 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 to curtail your lifestyle and helps you to live like a pilgrim because these things will keep reminding you that this world this present world is going to be destroyed so um, if you if you if you are a, a, a true believer and you you really want to um, um, make it 
till the end, endure till the end. You cannot run away from the prophetic books because of the apocalypse, a apocalypse that um, you know talk about. You know, the apocalypse are all the kind of destruction, the the pestilence, and the wars, and all that kind of thing. You can't run away from them. Rather, you should look at them because those things will actually help you to be sober. You will live soberly in this in this life. You know that you are a pilgrim, knowing that. Everything that you see, the most beautiful buildings, the end of it is that it will be destroyed as it was written in the book of Peter. So uh, we'll just look at um, Romans chapter 15, verse 4 to 7 to buttress this point that the learning of the scriptures is one of the ways by which, especially the prophetic books, is one of the ways by which God prepares his people to be able to endure to the end. So we'll, we'll look at um, Romans chapter 15, verse 4 to 7 quickly. Verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime mm -hmm. were written for our learning, mm -hmm. that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, mm -hmm. might have hope. Now, the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may be, that you may, with one mind and one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. So you can see it there. It says that the scriptures that were written were written aforetime for our learning. And then this learning will also um, produce something in us. What we learn in the scripture, one thing that the things we learn in the scripture will work in us is that it will work patience. And patience is actually required for us to have endurance. And apart from that, it will also give us comfort. So the scripture gives us, learning of the scriptures will give us comfort and learning of the scriptures will give us patience. And all this ultimately will work hope in us. And once you have hope, once you are not hopeless, you will be able to endure till the end. So we can see how this connects to helping us endure till the end. The scriptures will give us Patience, it will give us comfort and that will build hope. And that hope builds our resilience to be able to endure through the end, to, I mean, till the end. So, um, and I always tell people, how do you, how do you learn the scriptures? The scriptures are to be meditated upon. It says you shall meditate on the scriptures. It's not just read, meditate. And I'll give a framework on how meditation should be done. So the starting point is you read. You reflect on what you have read. You repeat what you have read to yourself. And then you also begin to question the scriptures. Why, is, why was this statement made? By the time you do all this, you go through all this for things I have mentioned, the scriptures will open up to you, all right? You will encounter the scriptures, you know. So it's very important that in these last times that we take our scriptural learning very seriously. It's one of the things that will help us to endure and build the resilience that is required to overcome the challenges of this end time. Another thing we need to do is that we need to pay attention to, to prophecies. Last week, Pastor Yomi told us that prophecies are inspired word. Prophecy is the inspired word of God. So apart from the scriptures that we read, when believers begin to have fellowship, God begins to grant grace and people begin to prophesy. That those prophecies they give also give us comfort. They give us encouragement, you know, and they help us to be able to endure, you know, the, the pressures of this time. So you are learning the scriptures and then you are paying attention to prophecies that come when believers meet, right? Now, if we go to um, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 20, he says, do not despise prophecies. Um, the New American Standard Bible says, 
do not reject prophecies. So um, God will give us inspired words by the people that we have fellowship with, or you can actually, you yourself can prophesy. God will give you an inspired word. And all those things are part of God's um, um, tools or, 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 or the advantage has given to us to be able to endure through the time. So we have now looked at the first pillar. Now we'll be going to the, the second pillar, and which is the second pillar, which is the fellowship of the, of the saints. Now, how does this help in our enduring till the end? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, and see what God says about the fellowshipping of ourselves, especially as we see the day approaching, especially these last, last days that we are living in. So Esther will read for us, and then we'll take it up from there. Okay? Not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some people, but admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. Now you can see the same thing, like I'm taking it up from where I stop, that believers come together, they admonish one another, they encourage one another, they warn one another, they urge one another. Many of this is going to be happening through prophecies. So the believers come together in a believers meeting and people now begin to prophesy. There are a lot of situations that, had, that, had, that, 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 that has happened where people escaped a lot of dangers through prophecy. Even right from the time of the scriptures, God had always sent prophets to warn people of impending danger. You'll see that even in the ministry of Paul, when Agabus met him, you know, and was telling him that this journey, the person, that he should not proceed on that journey, that if he proceeded on that journey, he was going to, to die. You know, I mean, Paul accepted the prophecy, but still proceeded, but the warning was there. So through the fellowship of the brethren, God will always bring words of prophecy. So I always tell people that it is not in every fellowship that prophecies can come. There are a lot of people that meet, but they don't give room for, for that kind of a thing to happen. So it's, it's the, the, the service, there are, there, are, there are a lot of um, meetings and, you know, that people have that I would even say the despise prophesying and that's why paul was warning do not despise prophecies because this is one of the things that god is going to use to strengthen his people against the pressures of this time and still on fellowship it's important that i just make a few comments now we are called to belong not just to believe so it's not enough for you to say, I believe in Jesus. I'm all by myself. I'm all alone. It's just God I'm serving. No. We are actually called to belong to a community. We are called to belong to, because that is how it was, even in the days of the apostles. Once you believe, then you belong. Right? So that is how it should be. So uh, the community of believers is, and, and the fellowship they have, is one of the ways that God strengthens his people. Uh, so while our relationship with Christ is personal, God never intends it to be private. We are created for community. We are fashioned for fellowship. And we are formed for a family. None of us can fulfill God's purpose, purposes for ourselves. And that is why there is a dear need for fellowship. And fellowship that actually um, entrenches or promotes the prophetic giftings, All right? So our life is meant to be shared and real fellowship is more than just showing up at a church service. It is experiencing life together. Real fellowship has to do with unselfish loving, honest sharing, practical serving, sacrificial giving, sympathetic comforting, now, if you are in a fellowship and you are not experiencing this, you are not having a functional fellowship. And it will affect 
how you will thrive even in this time. So what I'm saying is that a functional fellowship will have these things I have just listed. And then you, once these things I've just listed are happening in your fellowship, you will begin to see that the gifts of prophecies, people will be able to prophesy, you know, because it, it, it gives room for that spirit to work. All right. So, um, and this thing doesn't have to be, when I talk of fellowship, it doesn't have to be a big church. In short, um, statistics have it that um, small groups, small groups are actually more effective, you know, when it comes to um, experiencing some of the things that I've just listed. Uh, one book I read said, once the, 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 the group is more than 10, uh, it said, it's, 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 it, it, the effectiveness begins to reduce. So small groups, small communities of believers, right? Come together, have fellowship, unselfish, there's, there's no hidden agenda, and they come together. And as they have fellowship, God will begin to declare his mind, reveal his mind, and begin to tell them, give them specific in, instructions that, that is, is, is applies to their time and their moment, right? So, I also want to state here that there are about four levels of fellowship, which is something that we must be able to plug into. And that is, uh, you start off fellowship with the fellowship of sharing. One of the attributes of fellowship is sharing. And we see that even in the, in the, in the church, uh, in, 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 when the church started in, in the book of Acts. They shared everything in common. So one of the, 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 the cornerstones of fellowship is, is sharing what we have together. Uh, then we, we also, um, we study together, study the world, learn the words together that we have mentioned earlier. And then we serve together. We, we, we go on missions together, mission trips together. We serve the Lord together, organize programs together, do crusade together. By, by the time you are doing all this, you are, you are participating actively in fellowship. And these things will actually uh, strengthen you and keep you so that you will be able to endure till the end. Then uh, the, 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 the last level of fellowship, which is the deepest, is the fellowship of suffering, where we, we bear each other's burdens and then we, we share in each other's pains, uh, especially in our time now where there's a lot of persecution against Christians, you know, we need to, we, we will have this fellowship of suffering. And by the time we are able to do all this, these things strengthen us and um, make us uh, to be built in such a way that uh, the times do not overwhelm us. So key, very important, fellowship is one, especially prophetic fellowship is one of the ways that God is going to keep and to preserve his people in this time. So that is going to be to your advantage. So we want to look at um, an example of this kind of fellowship uh, as we read the book of Acts chapter 13, verse one to two. NLT version. Yes. Okay. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas and Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manian, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So you can see as these saints came together to have fellowship in prayer and in fasting. It was not a crowd just a few people and what what started happening prophecies started coming coming forth god began to speak and god began began to the assignment that was given to paul and barnabas is what shaped the entire new testament their work is their work was the most robust work and that work was born out of an effective fellowship that made god to begin to speak his mind as to what he would want Paul and Barnabas to do. And we all know how this men's ministry thrived. So um, I call these kind of services or these kind of meetings uh, prophetic meetings, you know, that God um, 
allows his people to have. And we need to have more of this kind of meetings in these times because God will begin to speak his mind, specific instructions. Now, if we are to have our meeting, Paul and Barnabas will not be in that meeting. It will be Esther, it will be Sam, it will be favor. And then God can speak as we meet and we are having fellowship and we are praying and worshiping him. Okay, I have a special work for, for Esther. So now that prophecy is unique to us. It's unique to us that are, to the group that we are, we are, we are, we are, we are fellowshipping with. Those are the real things, those are the kind of things that have to start happening now if we endure to the end. It's part of the ways that, because once you are able to know the mind of God, His grace now covers you. It gives you immunity <laughs> against whatever it is that is happening around you. And I always tell people, I say your greatest security is knowing what God wants you to do and doing it. Once you are doing that, nothing on earth can harm you or hurt you. So we need to be having this kind of small group prophetic meet meetings where people just come. No agenda. We're not asking God that, oh, we want to buy new cars or our promotion. We just come to worship God. We, no agenda. There don't need to be any prayer point. We just want to enjoy God. That's how fellowship should be. It's not because we want breakthrough. No. So when we come in this kind of meeting, or this kind of meeting like the one we just read that Paul, Barnabas, and a few of the teachers and prophets in the church of, in, of Ephesus had, the mind of God now is now going to be declared specifically to us as a group. And it may be that, um, Esther, I, I need you to go to uh, a village in Ogun State. Uh, there is something, there are some people there I want you to, to reach out to, right? So, so, so that now begins to give us insight into the mind and the will of God. And I tell you, like I have said, our protection is in doing what God says we should do. So it gives us immunity and it gives us covering for this time. So in these kind of meetings, God wants his people of impending judgments and the things he's about to do. Uh, then he also he, he gives his people insight of what they should do to enjoy the refuge he has provided for them. Then sometimes God gives specific word and instructions for groups and for individuals. And also, I always tell people that when you go for these kind of prophetic meetings, it's an opportunity for you to sync with God because prophecy is not static. Right? It's not static. It's always on the move. It's dynamic. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, Paul, Barnabas were given an instruction on what they should do, the special work God had for them. It didn't end there. Other people too met in different forests before now and God spoke and gave them instructions on what they should do. And as we meet, God ought to be giving us instructions. So if this is not happening in your life, then you are not taking full advantage of the prophetic grace that God has designed to keep and to preserve his people in this time. Somebody will ask, how often should we meet? <laughs> well, um, I know some people say they meet twice a week, some once a week. But let's look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Verse 13. Mm -hmm. But exhort one another daily. Ah. Huh? <laughs> daily I think we need to pause here <laughs> so and this still points to the fact that it's not a big group thing mm -hmm. because you can't have big group meetings daily, daily yes. it has to do with small groups Can communities people that reach each other, reach each, other mm -hmm. reach each other and why God is calling for this kind of frequency is because of the darkness in the land so we need to meet daily, as often as possible. But here, the Bible says daily. It says as long as it is called today and that there is an opportunity. So that what will happen? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So are you telling me that if we are not meeting daily, <laughs> <laughs> it can affect some people? So, well, the frequency, it all depends on you. If you think daily will be fine for you, which I, I strongly will recommend. <laughs> Please have as, as often as possible. But here the Bible was even talking about daily. So I should take the amplified. Okay, okay, let's look at the amplified. But he said, one, admonish, 
urge and encourage one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin by the fraudulence the stratagem the tr trickery which the delusive glamour of sin may play on him hmm. Hmm. this is this is this is quite uh, <laughs> heavy and it seems to me that god does not want to give the devil a chance any room any room so that's why he says daily so i don't know how often you have your fellowship but this is what the scriptures recommend i don't want to press in deeper than that he said a, a word is enough for the wise <laughs> all right so we move now to the next pillar which is um, prayer the next pillar is prayer so we've looked at the study of the scriptures especially prophetic books. And then we've also looked at um, fellowship of the brethren, especially prophetic meetings and prophetic fellowships. So now we are going to the third pillar, which is prayer. Like I said, none of these things is new, but we are trying to wrap it around the, the, the prophetic so that we can take advantage of the prophetic uh, work that God wants to do in this time. All right, um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Verse 2, amplified again. Looking away from all that we distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief, and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross despising and ignoring the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of god very good we saw in that scripture that jesus endured mm. the cross right he endured the cross and the scripture we read in matthew says that it is only those that endure till the end so can we learn from jesus how to endure Let's read Matthew chapter 26 from verse 36 to 39. Uh, because Jesus found himself in the most difficult situation in his life. The darkest hour of his life, which is similar to the dark times in which we are living in. And we want to see how Jesus was able to endure. Just like we read, it said he was able to endure, endure the cross. But there was a secret to that. That endurance didn't just happen. And that secret is prayer. So we'll just read that scripture and then we'll take it up from there. Matthew 26 from 36. Then come Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Just pause there. Mm. He was what? Sorrowful and very heavy. And when you look at the prophecies of the end time, they said it, in that place we read in Matthew, they said it's the beginning of sorrows. We are in sorrowful times. When you look at the news, no good news bad news everywhere you, you go civil unrest social unrest economic collapse that is all we see on the news in the week that just passed we saw how terrorists came in broke into the prison and freed criminals high-ranking terrorists that is telling you that nobody is safe anymore these things are things that makes us sorrowful and gives us heaviness of heart. And like I always tell people that whether we like it or not, whatever it is that happens in our country affects us directly or indirectly. So um, this is just similar to the times that we are living in. Things that, you know, um, bring heaviness to our heart. And if you recall, even the president's convoy was bombed in this same week. 
And when he was giving his, his statement, he said that um, something is wrong with our intelligence architecture, that our intelligence was poor. And, and that is actually what we need to win the war on terror. It is intelligence, you know, because you need to know before they strike. And um, God has always given his people intelligence. And part of the intelligence God gives his people is this prophetic advantage. He tells them things before they happen. And he gives them instruction on what they should do. Right? So, um, God always gave his people intelligence. Even in the Old Testament times, in the days of Elisha, the Syrians will have their plan. Before they come to attack Israel, Israel already knows their plan. Israel is waiting for them. And they now knew that there was a prophet in the land that was leaking all their secrets to them. And they actually came to come and ambush, <laughs> ambush him, which of course never worked. But that is how God has always preserved his people. He has always preserved his people through this prophetic advantage, through this spiritual intelligence. I call it spiritual intelligence, you know. So Jesus himself already knew what was going to happen. As Christians, we should not, things should not be just be taking us by surprise. A prophet and the most prophetic generation. A prophetic generation is a generation that will not just be, things will not just be taken on our ways. Jesus knew that he was going to die. By what? By what gift? By the grief, by the prophetic grace. He knew what was coming and that was why he was sorrowful. So, really, if anybody, um, uh, when you really study prophecies, yes, it makes you sorrowful. It makes you heavy. But those things are to push you to do something, to push you to pray. It helps you to, it's the Bible says we should watch and we should pray. So when you listen to all the bad news, <laughs> which you can't escape, it should push you to your knees to pray, knowing that you are not safe. And that the only place that you have safety is in God. All right, so we'll just continue from verse 38 now. 38, then said he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. 39. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. All right, so we, the, the, the concluding part of this story is that Jesus prayed and prayed through. And when he had prayed through, the Bible says that he prayed to a point that he's, 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 he sweated and the sweat was mixed with, with blood, you know, and he knew that he was ready. So prayer is one of the pillars, things that God, as the saints of God are able to pray. It's one of the things that will build endurance in, in us and help us to endure till the end, especially prophetic prayers. This prayer Jesus was praying was a prophetic prayer because it was a prayer about what something that was going to happen. So it was a prophetic prayer. So we need to have more prophetic prayers. The next thing that I want us to do is just to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Yes. But he said to me, my grace... My favor and loving kindness and mercy is enough for you, sufficient against any danger, and enables you to bear the, the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly glory in my weaknesses and infirmities, that the strength and power of Christ, the Messiah, may rest, yes, may pitch a tent over and dwell upon me. All right. Now, this was a prayer that Paul was praying uh, when he was also in a very tough situation. We saw how Jesus en endured through prayer. Now, this was Paul's own account. <laughs> on how he had to endure. And um, considering the times that we are, there are a lot of pressures all around us. And these are the kind of prayers that we need to pray. Now, if you read this same scripture in the message translation, it says, Satan's angel did his best to get me down. 
what he in fact did was to get me on my knees. So what we are saying in essence as we begin to wrap up is that yes, we know the pressures are much. But as we pray, the Lord himself will strengthen us and build our endurance capacity. This scripture was talking about the thorn in the flesh that, 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 that Paul had. But through the instrumentation of prayer, he was able, instead of, the, of that thorn, instead of, instead of the thing getting him down, the thing got him on his knees. So whatever pressures, it doesn't matter the pressures that we have, as long as we can get on our knees, the Lord will strengthen us to overcome them. So we'll read another scripture again. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, as we continue to, that will be our last scripture as we wrap up today. Verse 6, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craven and cringing and fawning fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. So these are the comforts of God's scripture coming to us again uh, this evening, letting us to not be afraid, irrespective of what is going on around us. Don't, so, don't yield to fear, right? But allow the spirit of the Lord. He said he has given us the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So we need to have more prophetic prayers as saints of God. So these things will help us in enduring till the end. So last but not the least, we go to the final pillar, which is discipleship. We just need 0.01% of a population to be able to disciple the entire population. So if, for instance, in Nigeria, you have a population of 120 million people, for instance, 12,000 disciples are enough to disciple the whole nation. Just 12,000. So if that is not happening, we are not getting something right. And we really need to check it. We need to check our modus operandi. And um, I would like us to take this from Luke chapter 19 uh, of the story of the, of the stewards that were given talents and they were supposed to make profit with it. One of the things that um, the master said to those servants was that they should occupy till he comes. And in order for them to be able to occupy till he comes, he gave them talents. Um, so the, the, the way that will be effective at, at discipleship is actually through the giftings of God in our lives. Occupying till he comes means that we, we go out there and capture more people, capture more territories, increase the frontiers of the kingdom, spread the light that we have received. And as we spread the light that we have received to those around us, the influence of light continues to increase. And as that begins to happen, um, we position ourselves to be able to endure till the end because uh, being doing this, uh, we're actually on the offensive, the Bible says light shines and darkness comprehends it not. So one of the ways for our light to shine is through the instrumentation of discipleship. As we go out there and lighten other people around us, we decimate the power of darkness. And once that is happening, then we are, we are already set up to be able to um, endure till the end because the impact of the darkness will not be so much on us. The darkness will not overwhelm us. It will not overpower us. Why? Because we are on the offensive. You know, it's just like when you are playing a game and you are just playing, playing defensive. It's just a matter of time. The opponents will, will soon score. But if you are on the attack, you know, if you're on the offensive, uh, it's, 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 it's the chances are that you will score the goal. And it, it, it should, the opponents will be so concerned with defending that they can attack you. So I think the instrumentation of discipleship is one of the offensive weapons that the Lord has given to us to be able to advance the frontiers of the kingdom, push back the heart, the, the, the influence of darkness as we lighten all those around us. And um, 
This we cannot do effectively until we are able to activate the giftings of God in our lives, one of which is the gifts of prophecy. Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, it says, let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to what? To prophesy. So here again, we are connecting what we are saying here about discipleship to the prophetic. If you, are, if you, if, if, if you plug your, your, your discipleship into the prophetic, you become more effective. And in my opinion, love and having the giftings of the Spirit are the most effective weapon in discipleship. So if you can show love to people, and you have the giftings of the Spirit, you'll be an effective disciple. So you can see here that it's, it's written boldly there. It says, um, especially the ability to prophesy. Paul said he wants everybody to be able to prophesy. So we're talking about the most prophetical generation. So that is to say that our generation is supposed to be a generation that will be so, so effective as, uh, at discipling others because of the prophetic advantage that we have. So um, we've looked at the four things or four pillars that um, once we can connect all these to the prophetic, we have prophetic advantage and we become more effective at them. And they include the pillar of learning the scriptures, fellowship, prayers, discipleship in within the prophetic framework. So this is a great advantage we have. And I'm sure that as you go back practicing these things that you have been doing before with this new light you have received, you'll be more effective and you'll be able to take that advantage you have been given, which is the prophetic advantage. Paul, in writing to Timothy, was telling him, he says that God has not given us the spirit of, of, of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. And all this comes together to now make us, when you have love, when you have power, when you have a sound mind, all this comes together to make you an effective disciple of men. And as you light all the men around you, you yourself are protected and you'll be able to endure till the end. So uh, that wraps it up again today. And don't forget all the four pillars that we have discussed in detail, the pillars, of um, learning the scriptures from the pillars to the pillars of fellowship. And then we also looked at the pillar of prayer. And lastly, we have looked at the pillar of discipleship. God bless you as you continue to leverage on this pillar to have that prophetic advantage that the Lord has provided for his people at this time. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man can come to God except by me. There is no alternative. 